get uh, started. And uh, uh, my name is Mentor. I'm from Arizona State University. And uh, my co-chair is, uh, uh, can I pronounce your name right? Marcelo uh, Matas from University of Chile. And the first talk is a keynote uh, speaker, uh, Professor Eric Loss from University of Virginia, right? Yeah. And the title of the talk is Extreme Scale Wind Turbines and How to Value Offshore Energy Storage. So, Eric, you are 40. <coughs> All right, thanks very much. Uh, very exciting conference, very glad to be uh, part of it, and um, looking forward to many, many great talks to come and, and enjoy the ones this morning. I'm going to be talking about a, a project that we're working on and try to build the world's largest wind turbines. But then I'll also talk a little bit about uh, offshore energy storage, and we think that those two can be related uh, with some of the great motivations we had this morning. So offshore, I think, is kind of the future of wind. We have a lot onshore in the United States. It's right now the biggest renewable energy uh, resource in terms of growth. Um, but really, the highest energy uh, in terms of uh, wind resources per, per area is, is just offshore. And this is a uh, color map showing the velocities. And you can see, especially near Boston, it's, it's bright red. It's a great place. So, there's great uh, gold just offshore, and, and Europe has already taken great advantage of that. Uh, Asia is moving very quickly in, into that regime. And if we go far enough offshore, we can be out of sight, um, out of earshot. We can be away from aviary paths, so we can have a pretty benign situation. But one troubling issue with the United States is we have hurricanes. And so we have to figure out how to make something that will be very resilient. We're also finding that not just going offshore, but going larger is really the trend with all wind turbines. They get continuously larger and larger all the, all the time. Every year, the GE, Siemens, Vestas, they're always announcing a yet larger wind turbine because the cost of energy keeps reducing as the scale gets larger and larger to utility entities. So that's kind of a big trend. This is what we're trying to do. It's kind of a crazy idea. Um, actually, I'm going to come back to this later on, but here's a little palm tree. It's 20 meters high. Um, palm trees are the tallest organic uh, entity that has the, the, the lowest weight. So I'm going to talk about that later on. We want to get a really high altitude with very low mass because mass is money. Money is also related, or mass is also related to energy. So we always want to reduce mass. We're going to be testing on something called the CART-2 in Colorado. Here's a conventional turbine in the United States. This is the turbine that we've designed recently. We've published. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. This is the one that we're working on right now. We uh, haven't published anything on that. We're just reporting with the DOE um, uh, folks on that. But it actually physically looks possible. It sounds very crazy to build something that big. But based on the concepts that we're working on, we think it could work. So I want to have to thank. Uh, uh, I'm going to read through everybody's names. A lot of fantastic people here. Uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, Texas, Colorado, Illinois, uh, GE, um, and of course, this graduate students do a lot of the work. But it's a fantastic group that looks at economics, it looks at the structures, looks at especially controls, uh, aerodynamics, and thinks about this together. And we can't do it without a very integrated um, co-control co design. So we said this crazy idea about 50 megawatts. It's much larger than anything that's out there. It sounds great. You know, let's go bigger. But is there a limit? And why don't we already have 50 megawatt turbines? So some of the issues have to do with fabricating a 50 megawatt turbine. This is one uh, a blade here for I believe it's a five megawatt turbine. It's enormous. You have to lay down the fiberglass and um, put it together in a single building and to usually heat it. Uh, to, to cure it, it's very difficult and complicated to build something very large. Then you have to transport it. What happens to our roads? Um, we can't really build a whole new uh, infrastructure, so we have to figure out how we're going to handle those blades. And then we have to figure out how we're going to construct it. And if we have something like a 13 megawatt turbine, a wind turbine, that's three blades that are 50 tons each blade and 100 meters. 
Oh, speak. Sorry. All right. So is that better? Okay. Um, so, okay. I'll, I'll try and stay put. <laughs> So before we get into how ours works, it's good to think about what are the different forces on a turbine? Because basically the, the, the blade mass of, of the rotor is related to the forces it has to withstand, the moments it has to withstand, and that really determines the tower, it determines the cell, even all the way down to the ground structure. And we have a, a few key forces we have to think about. Uh, we have an airfoil type of shape, which creates a lift. It provides a downwind thrust, a torque. Really, the downwind thrust doesn't get used for anything at all. That torque is what actually drives the turbine around and creates the power. So in that torque-wise uh, forces in this direction creates moments. We got centrifugal forces, gravitational forces. If you look at it from the side, it would look like this. Generally, Centrifugal forces are extremely large for a conventional wind turbine. But as the turbines are going to get larger and larger, what we'll see is that thrust and gravity forces, these two here, start to become significant. This shows for a 10 megawatt turbine what they would look like. Here's the centrifugal forces. They uh, cuts in at this speed. Then you've got rated wind speed where you're in constant power. Centrifugal stays the same because you have constant RPM. And here are your thrust and gravity forces. Gravity stays fixed. And here's your thrust forces. You can see these are no longer small compared to this. And if you go to 50 megawatts, they could be of the same order. So now we have to start to account for those. And I, I liken the, the fact that the gravity relative to centrifugal and these other ones gets larger and larger to the fact that at very small scales, we have almost negligible gravity compared to, say, surface forces. That's why an ant can walk upside down. But if I put an elephant there, you think I'm crazy. So that's because gravitational forces become really important. So what does this do to the actual forces on the turbine? If this is a blade right here, I'm going to put this in there. Whoops. All right, I won't do that. Um, if, this is a, if this is a blade right here, this my there. Oh, sorry, it's a little dim. You can see there's some downwind part. There's uh, basically this angle beta here, which is usually very, very small for a conventional turbine. But as we go to a larger, larger turbine, that angle beta, the load path angle, gets larger and larger. Instead of being just a few degrees, it can actually be 15, 20 degrees, especially go to these really crazy loads right here. That's a problem because this blade actually, if it has really high loads, can hit the tower. I'll kind of hopefully show an example. Artemis, if you'd be so kind. So this is a wind turbine that's operating in very high winds. You can see the trees rustling around there. The wind is coming left to right. It's a conventional upwind turbine, three blades. And it's going to go too fast, and the thrust force is going to be too high on the blades, and so they're going to bend back, and they can actually hit the tower. So this is one of the reasons we have a difficulty, because those thrust loads and gravity loads are going to actually be in the directions of making us hit the tower. So we're starting to get to a problem where Conventional three-bladed upwind can't handle that. Now, there's a company called Makani. Maybe some of you heard of them. They just got bought by Google, and so they got a lot of money. They said, well, let's just get rid of the blade altogether. Well, let's put everything in tensile. Basically, have this, uh, sorry, it's, not, it's a little bit weak here. But basically, they have an a, a electrical cord here that, that would be in tension. And so they can do everything in tension. Contention is a very efficient way to carry load as compared to cantilever shear load. And they said, oh, let's just build a kite. We're going to fly it around. The kite would pull out the cable with tension to drive the electric motor. And then we come back in, reel it in. It goes in and out. That's kind of their initial idea. Of course, didn't end up quite like that. This is where they're at now. They're actually, instead of having a kite, they almost have like a drone. And the drone actually has propellers at the at the top there, and the propellers are actually now the wind turbine. So they're no longer doing essentially a tension-based one. They're actually trying to capture uh, the wind. And these uh, four uh, blades right here are actually wind turbines that are flying up on this drone. So that's where they're going. There's a lot of complexity issues with this, but they're going forward with a lot of money, as you can see. We have a little bit of a different idea. So we want to kind of go with the flow. And our project is called Segmented Ultralight Morphing Rotors. Segmented, we're going to basically have the blades in different sections that we can put them together, easier to transport, easier to install, 
cheaper to manufacture. Ultralight, we need to make sure everything is very light because again, mass is money. Um, mass also uh, is something we want to minimize with respect to all, all aspects of the project. And morphing because we want them to essentially go with the flow. So that's our summer. And by go with the flow, um, let's see, I don't know if, I don't think this is movie plays. Just check Artemis by any chance. Oh, well, that's all right. This is a movie showing a palm tree in a hurricane being uprooted. And the, the, when you have a hurricane, everything is uh, susceptible to damage. And if you look in the background, you can see some palm trees there. Palm trees are very light. They're very tall, and yet they survive hurricanes. That's why we see a lot of them along the coast. They're actually segmented. If you look at their trunks, they're very fibrous. They're kind of hollow on the inside, very tall. The fronds can start to bend, and then when you get to really high winds, the entire trunk bends. In fact, the trunk can bend all the way and touch the ground, and the next day pop back up. So they go with flexibility. They go with the flow. So we wanted to make a turbine that does the same thing. So instead of making our blades upwind and trying to fight the wind like a heavy oak tree that might die, instead we're putting the blades downwind and allow them to be flexible and bend away from the wind when we get really high loads. So we're just kind of trying to basically make all these load path angles go right along the blade path. And we basically, as these load path angles change, we need to adapt that of uh, the blade angle, so we do that with morphing. We can do that with a very efficient uh, structure that's basically like a teeter-based system. We can open up at very low wind speeds to capture the most amount of energy, and at high wind speeds we can adapt and go with the flow. And so that's basically the concept. And this shows uh, simple von Mises stresses, taking a conventional blade and putting it in a cantilever uh, upwind position versus putting it in a position which is coned downwind at the load angle. You can see the stresses are dramatically reduced. So by going with this load align, go with the flow approach, we can really reduce the stresses. And what that allows us to do with our 13 megawatt is we've reduced the, uh, the mass of the rotor substantially by uh, 27% while still rotating nearly all the power. And we've done that both for steady state and for turbulent. Here's a turbulent uh, inflow uh, coming in. And if we look at the uh, blue as a conventional rotor and the red as our summer rotor there, we can see there's lots of fluctuations. The mean moment in this case is less, which is a good thing, even though this is a lower mass rotor, lower uh, nacelle, lower tower, everything has been reduced, so it's much lighter. Um, we can show that the average moments are going to be always less than a conventional one. And in fact, even the damage equivalent loads, which are related to the fluctuations, are always less. So even though we've reduced the mass, uh, reduced the weight of many of the components, we still can have um, lower damage. There's one thing that seems like everywhere I go and I give a talk about downwind turbines, they say, well, it's not going to work because you have tower shadow. And tower shadow is basically the wind comes along, it goes past the cylindrical tower itself, and then the blades are in its path. So if you imagine this is the, the tower here, it, it can have this shedded wake here, and the blade just have to go through its path, sees this very unsteady force. It would be equivalent to essentially hitting with a hammer every time it goes around. But by going with our downwind coned rotor, we actually end up moving our blade pretty far downstream of there. And it turns out the effect is extremely weak. So we did a lot of uh, simulations with uh, the UAE experiment, which is many of you may know in the wind turbine uh, field. This is probably the, the best experimental data ever for a downwind uh, turbine blade. And we have uh, simulations using FAST uh, that we've predicted very well the moments. And what we've shown is that once you consider field turbulence, there is this kind of knock here you can see this big dip here in the red, that's due to the tower shadow effect. But when you look at the integrated moment fluctuations, they're pretty small. And in fact, when you start to look at damage equivalent loads, it's only about 1% difference, the fact that it's downwind. So we had gained so much with only a very small penalty. And when we started to look at the um, cost of energy, this is work done by NREL, uh, when you take into account everything, we're able to reduce the cost of energy compared to a conventional turbine by 24%. And now we're actually building it, because it's one thing to kind of have a bunch of computers uh, saying that this is good. The next thing is to actually build it. So we're doing that uh, with something called gravo-aeroelastic uh, 
uh, method. What we basically don't want to necessarily reproduce the same power coefficient. What we want to produce is the same degree of air elasticity, the flexibility, the load angles, um, the, the, all the ratios of the thrust force to the centrifugal force, gravitational force, centrifugal force. We want to basically recreate that for what would be on a 13 megawatt scale. That would probably cost about 40, 50 million dollars to build a, a full scale prototype. So we're doing this uh, uh, subscale one for uh, less than $2 million. And the, um, oops, the turbine that we're um, designing is, is right here. We're doing a 20% scale, and these are all the different um, uh, characteristics. I might point you this, the, the weight of the blade, if it was gravel aeroelastically scaled, is 370 kilograms. And we're gonna replace the blade we're taking off of the CART-2, which is shown up there, weighs almost six times more. So this is where the ultralight part comes in. This blade has to be much, much lighter if we're gonna have a much lower cost of energy. And in this case, where they test it, they can get winds up to 100 miles an hour and routinely almost every winter in uh, the National Wind Technology Center. So it has to be very, very robust. And that's why this, this blade weighed so much is to be able to handle those 100 mile hour winds. And we need to do it with an ultralight blade. And this is uh, the molds that uh, was built uh, 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 in the Seattle area and shipped to Colorado. And then Artemis, if we could jump uh, maybe halfway through this. And uh, this is kind of them putting it up. We were very excited to actually see it uh, go up. And there's the, the crane. This is uh, just uh, west of Denver. And uh, the mountains on the other side, Denver's on this side, and it's between two mountains where they get these really high velocity winds. You can see some other conventional three-bladed turbines over there. This is the CART-2, which is made for two-bladed turbines, which is designed for upwind, so we've had to re-do um, so much of the infrastructure associated with this to make it into a downwind. But this is gonna be the first uh, real downwind turbine that uh, NREL has tested with this, uh, with this technology, the low-to-line technology. Um, and they, basically those are the blades up there. They're kind of turning it in different ways within the cell. If we go to the next uh, movie here, this is after it's been fabricated. I don't know if we can play this movie too, Artemis. Um, is it, if you put over here, will it play by any chance? Cool. So this is uh, in park conditions. Park conditions usually doesn't mean it's braked. It's actually just free. And this shows the two blades uh, on here. We actually, you may notice one blade is white, one blade is light brown. We really wanted to go ultralight. I was like super excited to have the absolute lowest weight blade possible. So when they told me the actual, the actual uh, amount of weight due to paint on that other blade was gonna be another 20 kilograms, I said absolutely no way because they were perfectly balanced. So they did not paint that blade. I didn't wanna add a counterweight to make up for that. And this is a time when they were getting about 75 mile hour gusts. And you can see that the blades are gonna kind of move around and flex a little bit here. But in general, even though this is extremely lightweight and it is uh, uh, flexible, it can handle these very high wind speeds. And you may remember the bomb cyclone came through Denver uh, about a month ago. Our turbine was up there and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And the next day it was okay. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully we're going to start testing in a few weeks in operational conditions. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, great press for all this, but uh, we have a lot of uh, technical journal articles or at summerwind.com. We probably have about 25 journal articles just on this uh, project alone. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, as time permits, about storage. So we've gone supersized. We think that can really reduce the cost of energy, and that's really important. But as wind becomes a bigger and bigger part of the energy portfolio, we get into this problem here, which is kind of shown by this little cartoon. Here's power as a function of time. Wind is that red line there, and it's all over the place. And we heard nuclear can be good base load. That'd be kind of a, a flat line. The problem is we don't know when, when wind is gonna go. So that's really not good for the grid, this intermittent, uh, non-predictable uh, source. At least with solar, you kinda know that's gonna be a little bit uh, scheduled uh, during the daytime. So that's a problem with wind, and that's gonna be a bigger problem as we go forward. And the question is, can supersizing help? And the answer, I think, is definitely. 
So if we think about available wind power, which is that blue curve, if we can basically store energy, which is shown in the red curve, we can do it in such a way that the green line would be constant power out. That would be the ideal. Nice to sketch it. How do we do it? This is a, a diagram that was shown this morning. I think it was really great. It uh, shows a lot of different energy storage technologies. On, on one axis there is the time for discharge. It's also similar to time for, uh, uh, um, for basically charging. And on this axis is the typical scale. Uh, we've got power quality, which are to handle low frequency or high frequency fluctuations. Then we've got uh, load shifting here, which is stuff that maybe operates on the order of minutes or hours. But if we had, want to take an entire wind farm and basically apply storage, really the two best technologies are uh, pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage. They have capability for really, really large scale. Um, and they really need to store only on the order of hours. That's typically the wind um, fluctuations are going to be high for a few hours, down for a few hours. So this is kind of the perfect sweet spot. The problem is you either uh, need to have a lake right next door, which unfortunately is not too happy. We were just talking to a colleague from Austria. It, pumped hydro storage is fantastic, but they're not letting us build too many more dams. It's almost the opposite. They're taking out dams. So while this is a great solution to combine with wind, the opportunities are not there for much growth. Compressed air energy storage is another really good one, but it's usually very expensive because of the fact that it has the container. In fact, both hydro is very expensive container. You have to build a dam. You have to have a lake. If you want to build it, it's a ridiculously expensive. And if you have to have all these high pressure storage containers, that can be very expensive. The material, unlike, say, lithium ion, is cheap. Water and air, it's kind of free. So the question is, can we get, get around the problem with this very expensive container? If we do compressed air energy storage, that's a high pressure container. Gee, I wonder where we can get something that would be like a cylinder that can contain high pressure. That's just actually our turbine tower. So if we take the turbine tower itself, and we think of they're typically made in steel, and we think about how much storage time we'd like to be able to store for like a day, we can do with, say, steel. And if we uh, have some different head weights here, you can see it's really not that much with steel. But the idea has been going on that we may be converting towers, wind turbine towers, to composites. And if we go with E-glass or S-glass, you can see that it's probably about 30% more for the cost of the tower. But you can see the amount of energy storage that we can put in there is really incredible. So if that switch happens, which I think is definitely happening, there's already been a lot of work on there, then you're looking at storage on the order of a day, maybe even more, once you have rated powers on the order of 10, 20 megawatts. So now you can store a lot of energy just in the tower alone. And the way you would do it may be something like this. Instead of having an electric generator here and transmitting out, you take that electric generator, which is extremely heavy, and move it down here, where it's kind of easier, more serviceable, and replace it with a very cheap hydraulic pump. And then you basically put all your storage inside the tower using pressurized air and liquid is a good combination. And then you can just have that energy transmit out. And the nice thing is the generator here has to only be scaled for the average power you push out. You don't have to scale it for the peak power. So this, all these fluctuations are eliminated. You save a 10 megawatt turbine, which goes zero sometimes, 10 sometimes, four megawatts average. You only size this generator for four megawatts as opposed to sizing this one for 10 megawatts. So, and the other nice thing is that you have usually a gearbox here when you have a conventional one, which is very expensive, breaks down a lot, that can be completely eliminated by doing this way. Another nice thing about that, sorry, this picture's a little fuzzy, is that if you do offshore wind, there's all kinds of substations and transmission lines, and it's really fuzzy, I apologize for that, uh, basically connections to the grid. All these are scaled by the peak power that the system would have to deliver. And if I have, say, a 250 megawatt wind farm, which 50 conventional turbines with five megawatts, even though it's rated for 500 megawatts, it only gonna produce 200 megawatts on average. Whereas if I can do storable turbines, then basically the rated power is also equal to the average power. So the amount of power coming out of these two is exactly the same, but you can see this one has two and a half times more rating. And therefore all these things have to be two and a half times larger. And 
to within a few percent, the cost of all these components here is proportional to the rated power. So if we can integrate the energy within the turbine itself, we can dramatically reduce the sh ship to shore uh, electrical connection. And some of this is borne out in this particular one. I have to give a shout out for Applied Energy, it's one of my favorite journals. So this, we published some of this in terms of the cost. If you can basically convert to uh, this uh, tower here with conventional turbine to one that includes uh, compressed air energy storage with a hydraulic motor at the top, we estimate you can save 17% in terms of the cost of energy. That's really incredible. And what's also good is this doesn't take into account the fact that you're now delivering steady supply of energy instead of intermittent energy that is not predictable. And that's actually a big problem we heard today about, well, levelized cost of energy. That's a pretty reasonable thing to use. I actually think it's a terrible thing to use for all these intermittent ones. Because it, if you have something that produces power at a constant um, a rate versus something that's crazy and unpredictable, from the grid's perspective, those are valued two very different ways. And so we need a way to account for that and we need to stop using levelized cost of energy. And I think Europe is very far ahead of us, going beyond LCOE, and we're working on something called the cost of valued energy, which will be given in a talk, I believe, 5 or 520 by Juliet Simpson, uh, paper number six. So I'm kind of a little shout out for that one. And in conclusion, uh, this load align concept and morphing can reduce the downwind moments, allow reduced rotor and head mass. We We've shown with a lot of publications now, 13 megawatts will work. And so far, our experiments are all kind of lining up that same way. Uh, we're really particularly interested in this big prototype that's going to be tested on a 10-story tower. And we think that combining this with energy storage is a way to further reduce LCOE and I think more importantly, provide energy levelization. Thank you. So thank you, Erica, for a very enlightening talk. So we have a time for questions, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks. I thought that was actually really uh, Would you please identify yourself first, oh, and then sure. a question? Uh, Sarah, can I stand up? Sarah Jordan, I'm a faculty member at Johns Hopkins. I actually, I thought this was really cool, especially the use of the empty space. I mean, I know people often down in the winter, right? Um, and I thought it was really cool that they were using that sort of story. I thought it was a really neat idea. What I missed, though, and maybe, uh, maybe you addressed it, but you said at the beginning that there was potential for uh, very large turbines where it's challenging to transport these over your slides if you showed images of at the beginning. And I have heard some uh, ideas for using different ways of um, adhesives that have been used, for example, for space applications and work turbines so that you can construct things on site uh, more easily. Yeah. Now, in your presentation, you mentioned that your innovations might be looking at some ways of dealing with Yeah, and I, and I apologize. It's such a big group, I probably could give you know 500 slides and still miss a few really cool parts. But I think that's a very important part as we go larger and larger is, is not only manufacturing them in segments, but how do we um, combine them together and do that in such a way that it doesn't uh, incur a lot of uh, extra mass uh, and cost. And uh, thermoplastic um, adhesive in and uh, essentially com um, Fixtures are one way that people are thinking about doing it. 3D added manufacturing is another way people are thinking about doing that. Um, we're looking at more mechanical fixtures at this point. Um, that's the group at Texas is working on that. Todd Griffith, who used to be at Sandy National Labs, now has moved there, um, is really the one who would answer that question better. And we haven't published anything on that, so I'm not supposed to say anything. But it does definitely looks uh, reasonable. We're working on a three-segment blade at this point. But it's very important, and we need to work that out. So I know it can work with low mass. We're not sure about the low cost yet. That's a big, tricky one. Very heavy, how do you handle that? Then you mentioned that you can put it on the ground with the energy storage, then you have to have a long shaft. Then that cannot be a very good one. But how do you do it in the off in the offshore that you cannot put the generator on the ground and water? Then it yeah, that's an excellent question. So there's still a lot of issues we have to sort out with 50 megawatts. 13 megawatts, I think it's gonna work. 50 megawatts, you're right. All everything is beyond what 
you can go out there and purchase, so to speak, or order or even have uh, conventionally designed. We would use hydraulic lines to transmit the power from the nacelle to the ground, and they would be uh, pretty large diameter. We've estimated about 3 or 4% uh, energy loss due to all the hydraulic transfer, because you're right, there's no way you're going to do that with a shaft that's 250 meters long. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing. We, we would expect that you're going to have a platform at the base where you would load the uh, generator. The good thing is that the operations and maintenance and, and accessing something that's at sea level is going to be much uh, better than trying to access something that's 100 meters or above. But we need to kind of sort out all those issues. Um, and there's also the part probability of having kind of distributed generators. Because if you bring it down with hydraulics, you don't necessarily just need to feed one generator. You could f feed multiple generators, too. And that could help with that aspect. I'm not, but yeah, that may be a very good option. And the nice thing is once we use hydraulics, we don't have to drive it uh, at something that's the RPM of the wind. Now we can just drive it uh, based on um, the hydraulic motor that's at the base. So we can go at pretty high RPM. Uh, Mary Jaffrey from uh, MIT. Uh, that's a very interesting idea to store the energy in the pole. But uh, I was thinking that uh, from uh, the owners, I mean, the wind farm owner's point of view, it's not always the case to uh, have constant power, but uh, rather store it uh, in low price hours and sell it in big price. And it does not like uh, change the generator parts, uh, scaling down and yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, while it would be good to go from intermittent, unpredictable to constant power, it would be even better to go to something which is basically energy on demand. And so you would maybe line up with the duck curve or whatever the, um, the basically spot price is. So I think you could, we could take the same concept and go even further and actually store energy and release it basically on demand or on price. So. Uh, that wouldn't, you wouldn't get uh, as small of a generator at that point, but you may be worth paying for an extra generator to be able to, to produce the power when it's needed or basically when you can make the most money. And maybe even pull it off the grid if it's free or negative, right, sometimes. Okay, I'll make a uh, uh, You have fluid, right? The power for heat compute. Then, if you 10 megawatts of power, if you have some fluid, the was fluid rate and the river number, that type of thing. So just efficient. And a similar question is total energy, right? It's heat times delta volume. So, so such kind of volume, and for the you have power, the was is almost fixed, right? Basically, the pressure is fixed. So then the total energy contribution to the wind power energy is a significant part number or just 1% the number. So this is a relevant question. Second question really, or third question is, I saw it's very interesting. You have power here, you have uh, shadow behind that, you have this type of shape design. But I saw your experiment, you see a wrap around it. Power. I guess probably it's hard to locate the power yourself. So, can you have some comments on this question? Sure. Uh, maybe I'll. My slides are already off, but I'll. I'll, I'll hit the second question first about the tower shadow effect. Actually, our original design was to build this ultralight fairing that the tower would be stationary, but the fairing could be made out of fabric and basically rotate passively, just kind of like a, a flag or, or a weather vane and to eliminate this fact. But to be honest, once we went to this downwind aligned rotor, we really didn't see that much effect of the tower shadow. So while we could still do this kind of a, a lightweight fabric fairing that could spin around, we have a patent on it. I actually don't think you should do it. I think it, it's fine that that shadow effect was not a big issue. Um, the first question you asked was about you know, being careful about the efficiency. So we did uh, basically size out the hydraulic lines. And you want to size it out so you have your Reynolds number just below turbulent flow. So otherwise, your, your skin friction goes up. So we basically sized out our lines for about a Reynolds number 1,500 for peak power. 
Um, and it's really not a big deal. To, and the cost of hydraulic lines are they're pretty cheap. So uh, I think we sized out four, four lines would be enough for a 13 megawatt turbine to take the power to ground with like 4% loss of energy. It, it, I mean, it's still significant, but the benefits we get from being able to store it were just so great. So, but that's, a, that's an issue we need to still think about. We can maybe think of using polymer drag reductions if we want to go into turbulent conditions, but we feel like maybe it's easier to stay laminar. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, well, that's the question, yeah. Uh, thank you for the, yeah, I'm thinking that uh, when you talk about the benefits of the flexible grid, um, so what I know is people block the hydrogen thing. So I'm just wondering if whether the flexible grid has also can benefit from this. Uh, if you become on the grid, you still have that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we originally had uh, the idea th that the blades could bend all the way back, so not just bend uh, 10, 12 degrees, but bend like 60, 70 degrees. But we found out that uh, we were able to design the blades um, so they're stiff enough um, and yet still them, still them being lightweight because they're really kind of mostly in tension. Um, and so you saw that we could handle 75 mile an hour winds. We want to be able to design our design actually, I think, should go up to 150 mile an hour winds, which is really, um, you know, really, really strong winds. And based on the IEC standards, should be able to handle Class uh, 1A, which is the most extreme type uh, conditions. So we think we're going to be fine with uh, the hurricanes, basically, with this particular concept. So um, you do have to worry about. There's so many IEC standards. There's literally hundreds. You know, there's the park conditions where it's braked the park conditions where you have power failure, the park conditions where it's rotating but you lose yaw. And so we have to check uh, all those, but we've, um, we've checked all the major IEC standards and this turbine passes all of them. So far, so good. But now we're starting to work with the companies and they will you know, be a little bit more meticulous than us. So university, we're not selling anything yet, so. <laughs> Thank you, Alec. And